Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar from the Book Industry Study Group, Reaching the Incarcerated, What the Publishing Industry Can Do to Support Readers in Detention. I'm Brian O'Leary, Executive Director of BISG, and I'm pleased to be able to host this program, uh, which is put together with the help, significant help, really, of Julie Blackberg, who is both uh, an ad, um, a real advocate for BISG and a real advocate for this idea. Uh, today's program actually has three different components. Uh, we're going to hear from author, activist, and entrepreneur Chris Wilson, who's going to speak about his own incarceration experience and how books transformed his life. We'll then hear James Tager, who's going to share uh, hear from James Tager, who's going to share his insights from research that he's done for Pan America on freedom of expression and the impact of banning books in jails and prisons. And then Victoria Law is going to lead a conversation with two subject matter experts. Um, Renee Barnes, who's Library Development Supervisor for the Colorado Institutional and Prison Libraries, and Artie Finn, who's co-founder of American Prison Data Systems. Victoria herself is a freelance journalist and an author fo focusing on mass incarceration, and we're lucky to have her to moderate today's work. So uh, to get us started, I'd like to invite Chris Wilson, who's a visual artist, author, film producer, and social justice, justice advocate to share his, his perspective. Through his work, he's been investigating societal injustices, uh, uh, human relationships, and public policies. His is the, uh, he is also the author of The Master Plan, and his artwork is collected and displayed internationally. And he's the founder, and he'll probably be able to talk to you a little bit about the Chris Wilson Foundation which supports social entrepreneurs and prison education, including efforts to, on re-entry and financial literacy, um, as well as art-related programs. Chris, thank you for being here today and welcome to the webinar. Thanks for having me today, Brian. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I wanna talk about briefly how books have changed my life. And I think throughout this experience, uh, this transformation, unfortunately, uh, well, maybe fortunately happened while I was in prison. But a little background history about myself is that I am originally from Washington, D.C. And I used to live about eight blocks from the East Capitol Library. And the route was through the Lincoln Heights uh, housing project, which was a very dangerous housing project. And I used to get in trouble uh, every time I went to the library. And I wanted to go to look at the globe you know, or to hear stories. Uh, and read books, it was a passion of mine. Uh, but this was around the late 1980s and early 90s. So it was a lot of violence in the neighborhood, but every chance I got, I went to that library to read books. Uh, and at this East Capitol Library, I was able to escape reality. I traveled the world, uh, I would read about China and England and Africa. And I listened and wondered uh, to the stories of the great you know, ancient libraries and, and ancient Egypt and Alexandria. And I checked out children's versions of the classics and I would read them at night, wrapped up in my blanket at night on the floor uh, because there was so much gun violence in my neighborhood. And I was afraid a stray bullet would come through my window at night. And I remember reading these books about a book a week um, as a young person. And I thought, you know, the world is so big so bigger than like my neighborhood and what my friends and I would talk about. And it's such, it's such, it's filled with such ideas and all kinds of things. And I could go anywhere and I could do anything with my life. And I was a young person with imagination. Uh, but I ended up getting into trouble after some, some people came after me and my family and I took a person's life and I was sentenced to life in prison. And I remember sitting in on my bunk in solitary confinement and you know, I just started crying because I had this idea of how big the world was. And I was told as a child, as a juvenile that I had to spend the rest of my life in prison. And about a year later, I met this person uh, named Stephen Edwards who was, uh, had a big stack of books and was teaching himself computer programming. And I asked him like what he was doing. And he said, I'm gonna teach myself computer programming. I'm gonna get out of prison one day and I'm gonna start a software company. And I started laughing at him. And I said, dude, we both got life. We're never getting out of here. And he, he asked me to look around at people in, in the rec room and people were like getting tattoos and people smoking weed and shooting dice. And he says, they've taken everything from us but no one can take away the knowledge that we, we put in our minds. And it was just around the time 
that I started thinking about myself. I knew that I was a good person. I knew that I loved to read. I knew that I was intelligent. I could like retain 70% of 300 page books that I read. And so I wrote up what I call now my master plan of how I would turn my life around through education, through therapy, and through paying it forward by helping other people uh, embrace education and therapy uh, and entrepreneurship too. And so I went on to, to study and, and teach myself languages, mostly through the library. And I would go to the library. I was the first one in the library every day in prison. And I was probably the last one to leave. And so I ended up spending 16 and a half years uh, of my life in prison. Uh, and I remember coming home and being homeless and unemployed. Uh, but I ended up going back to school because I knew I had this hunger to learn. And while in school, I flourished as a straight A student. I ended up getting a job doing exactly what I wanted to do, workforce development and community organizing. I ended up starting companies that provided job opportunities for people who needed help the most, mostly returning citizens. But one of the things that I never stopped doing was uh, reading books. And even to this day, I still read a book a week uh, uh, in addition to founding several companies and, and winning you know, every award in the state of Maryland, including a presidential award from uh, Barack Obama, um, I've started uh, a foundation, the Chris Wilson Foundation, where uh, I've been on a quest to get my book in every prison in America. And, and since my book has been in publication the past two years, I've uh, raised over $300,000 and donated 100% uh, of that money uh, towards books to put in the hands of people uh, that are incarcerated. And I think, you know, the reason why I'm here, I believe um, on this panel and, and speaking is because there, there's a power uh, to people being able to have access to education, particularly people uh, incarcerated. And, and this is why I wanted to work alongside uh, APDS as the director of engagement is because we wanna end the revolving door of incarceration and providing incarcerated people with, with education and the tools for them while they're incarcerated and, and them understanding how they can learn coming home and training, like books are the key, I believe, uh, to helping people uh, stay out of prison, to helping people gain a job, to helping people reacclimate to their families. And so um, it's an honor for me to be here to speak to you guys. And I'm looking forward to the panel conversation where we can go deeper into uh, what we can do uh, in the publishing industry um, to help people. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And I think that's a really important, sobering and, and hopefully inspirational story for what books can do for prison, for people who are imprisoned in, in the United States. I mentioned before that James Tager was going to share his insights. Uh, James is the research director at PEN America. He wrote the book, Literature Locked Up, How Prison Book Restriction Policies Constitute the Nation's Largest Book Ban. Uh, he previously worked with the International Commission of Juris, Asia and Pacific Program, first as a Satter Human Rights Fellow and subsequently as an International Associate Legal Advisor. He has lived and worked in Thailand, Myanmar, and Cambodia and holds a BA from Duke and a JD from Harvard Law School. Uh, James, thank you for coming today and thank you too for the support that Penn is providing for this program. Thank you so much. It's a privilege to be part of this panel. Um, you know, just a few weeks ago, we finished up Banned Books Week and I suspect that um, all the attendees had that on their radar um, and every band books week we talk about um, the book bands we're facing across the country um, often in schools and libraries um, an issue that receives comparatively less attention is book banning in prisons with over 2.2 million americans incarcerated um, the system of restrictions that affects their access to literature is the largest book ban in this country um, I like to break it down, these book bans, in, 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 in two ways. And, and when we, we think about how an incarcerated person receives a book, either they're going to receive it um, through, you know, some type of book club or educational program that's offered in, in their prison, which is uncommon, or uh, far more likely, it's either they go to their, their prison library or they receive it directly, that it's sent to them as a package, right? Um, Overall, when we look at access to literature for the incarcerated population, this was my conclusion looking at the issue in September 2019. It's that the book restrictions in American prisons are often arbitrary, overbroad, opaque, 
subject to little meaningful review and are overly dismissive of incarcerated people's right to access literature behind bars. I usually break down what we what I consider to be what we consider to be book bans in a prisons into two categories, content based and content neutral book bans. Content based book bans is when uh, an individual's book is blocked from reaching an, uh, an incarcerated person because a prison official decides it's too dangerous for whatever reason. And they have wide latitude, both under their regulations, prison regulations, and under the system of legal review that has been approved for them. Prison officials have broad latitude to um, ban books uh, for a variety of reasons that can easily be wielded in arbitrary ways. Things like sexual content, things such as depictions of criminal activity, uh, encouragement of group disruption or anti-authority attitudes or actions, or racial animus or language perceived to encourage hatred. I hope it stands out to all of you that each of these are sort of widely subject to sort of individual interpretation and can be wielded arbitrarily. And, we, and we've seen that, um, you know, I hope that I don't have to go through with you some of the crazy examples we've seen over the years, right? Examples of pr a prison banning a map of the moon because they were afraid that it'll teach incarcerated people how to read maps and thus escape, right? Uh, there was a prison who blocked uh, President Obama's memoir. Um, we've seen civil rights movement memoirs be blocked on the idea that it will stir up anti-authority animus or racial animus, right? Um, you don't have to be, um, you don't have to have the mentality of, of, of I'd say, uh, being inherently critical of prison officials to know to realize that prison officials are people and that they carry their biases and their prejudices prejudices with them, and that will manifest itself in the books they choose to block. An individual um, officer in a prison can block a book. Uh, the institution may decide for a, an institution-wide block, or the pri the prison system, the entire state si prison system, may uh, decide a prison-wide block. Right. Many um, states have centralized book bans where the state bans a book for any institution within the state. Uh, you can find those book bans. Um, I think books to prisoners.net has a great listing of, of the book bans. And by the way, we don't have good information on how up to date that information is. Right. A lot of this information about what is being banned in prisons reaches the public episodically. It may reach us months after the ban is put into place. It may reach us years after the ban is put into place. We really don't have, um, when I say we, I say people in this space analyzing these issues, don't have a comprehensive understanding of what uh, books have been blocked where because we don't have visibility, right? So that's a content-based book ban. Um, Content neutral book bans are, are our term for something that we're seeing an increase of, which is the idea that you're not blocking individual books because of their content, but you're blocking all books as packages sent to the prison, right? Prison officials will usually justify this, and more and more recently we're seeing this through security uh, rationales. They'll, they'll, they'll justify kind of pretty much anything through security rationales, but um, they will argue that books can be used to smuggle contraband, um, they very rarely offer compelling evidence for this. Uh, uh, an example that I love to point to, which was recent as of the time of my 2019 report, was a Washington State Bureau of Prisons announced that they were going to ban all books from, um, uh, I think all books other than maybe one or two vendors and maybe all books from any not previously approved vendors from being sent to prisons because they said, oh, we found 17 examples of contraband smuggled through books. When a local journalist asked them, hey, can I see the examples you're talking about? The next day they reversed that ban. Why? Because they realized that what they'd done is some individual um, prison official had just typed in the word book comma contraband into their internal search engine, found 17 instances of that showing up and said, oh good, 17 instances of contraband in books without looking through and noticing that the examples were things like officer Booker found contraband, right? So what we're talking about is a system that's not used to sort of being challenged in its decision and where there's very little oversight because there's very little public visibility. When these bans occur and the public finds out about them, they're often withdrawn. But public outrage is not a consistent oversight mechanism. Um, overall, where we need to be on this 
is towards people like the people in this room, publishers. Publishers have a major role to play in this. Publishers can make a significant dent in this issue. If we, A, start articulating what we believe is the right to read in American prisons and start articulating as a positive right and not just something to be less restrictive, right? Um, I will talk about um, in this conversation specific steps that um, publishers can do, I think today, to try and promote um, access to literature for the incarcerated population, but it will be things such as check for um, check the centralized book bans that are already out there and see if your books are being blocked. Um, some states will have rules where they have to notify not just the person who was supposed to receive the book, but the publisher that their book was blocked. Right? If you are a publisher. Do you have a process for at least collating and centralizing when you receive those types of notices? And do you have a process for pushing back when you find out that your book has been banned, right? I hope that you leave, all, all the attendees leave this conversation feeling like this is personal to you, right? This is a prison official telling you that one of your author's books is considered to be too dangerous to put in the hands of an incarcerated individual. And I hope that upsets you. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to discussing additional you know, steps that publishers can take, but there are concrete steps that publishers can take today to be allies on this issue. And I briefly listed out some of them and I look forward to discussing them further. Thank you. Thank you, James. And, and I think your passion for this really comes across. I'm glad you brought it today. The uh, Victoria Law, as I mentioned, is a freelance journalist and author focusing on mass incarceration. Her books include Resistance Behind Bars, The Struggles of Incarcerated Women, as well as Prisons Make Us Safer and 20 Other Myths About Mass Incarceration. She's the co-founder of Books Through Bars. It's a MIC, which is an all-volunteer organization that sends free books to people incarcerated around the country. She's welcoming today two speakers, uh, Renee Barnes, who's library development supervisor, for the Colorado Institutional and Prison Libraries, and Artie Finn, the co-founder of American Prison Data Systems, a public benefits corporation that's working to promote free and ethical education options for in incarcerated learners. Uh, Victoria, very much thank you for moderating today, and I'll turn the, the floor over to you. Thanks, Brian. And thank you, Chris, so much for sharing the importance of books to people in prison. And thank you, James, for the overview of how people get books um, and all of the additional censorship that happens behind bars that so many people have no idea about. Uh, I co-founded Books Through Bars New York City back in the mid 1990s. And we have so many dumb rejection slips based on content for things that are ridiculous. Um, one of the latest ones was a censorship of Good Housekeeping Magazine for a Depends ad. How, oh, in a women's prison too, where women often see each other in various states of undress. So these are not logical book bans. This is, these are arbitrary and capricious and really need to be challenged. Um, but we can talk more about this when we get into a discussion. First, I'm going to ask uh, first Renee and then Artie to introduce themselves and tell us more about their work in depth. So Renee, as the librarian, who goes into these prisons. Tell us more about you know, what you do and how you do it. Sure, so currently I supervise the Institutional Library Development at the Colorado State Library. And um, we, we work, my unit works directly with library staff on all, all things library related, including um, we spend um, a significant amount of money purchasing materials for the libraries. We also work closely with library staff um, to help them formulate their um, challenges to censorship. As a prison librarian prior to coming to ILD, I spent countless hours on those committees examining things, looking at the criteria for deciding whether or not something gets censored. And when librarians are on those committees, they are often, they often wind up being the only ones advocating for um, allowing something in. We're often the only, only voice in the room saying that. Um, so we do a lot of, we spend a lot of time supporting library staff in their efforts um, against censorship as well. And I've been, been doing this for about six, 16 years in and with um, correctional libraries. So yeah, a little bit. Artie, 
Uh, hi, uh, I'm Artie Finn. I'm the co-founder of APDS and the head of business development for APDS. Um, we are both a public benefits corporation and a B corporation with a social mission to uh, end the revolving door of corrections, as Chris said. Um, and we do that uh, by providing individualized education, rehabilitation, job training, and reentry plans for anyone involved in the criminal justice system. Uh, as a PBC and a B Corp, we never charge incarcerated folks and their friends and family for access to our services. So we uh, charge the jurisdictions. We're now in, I think, 20 states, over 100 institutions, and we work across the spectrum of incarceration from anybody who's actually incarcerated in a prison and jail, um, in the juvenile space, all the way through uh, parole, probation, alternatives to incarceration. Relevant to this conversation, we also built something from the very beginning called National Corrections Library because we wanted to expand the access um, of free books to folks who are involved in the system. Uh, we've since expanded that free book library to also include audio books. Um, and I can get more into what that uh, involves. But uh, James, since uh, 2019, we have uh, now a different way for folks to get access to books uh, in a digital world. Um, and it helps also for folks who have um, uh, disabilities, um, particularly on the audio side. So uh, that is our approach. Thank you, Artie. Um, and it's really heartening that there is a corporation that uh, provides digital books for free because most of the time, and I want to be clear to the people on this uh, webinar that this is Artie and AP, uh, APD, uh, American APDS. Prison Data Services are kind of a unicorn because most corporations charge people money for the tablets, for the device, and it is not cheap, it is 60 to $70 for people who are making cents per hour or whose family members are often poor. Um, they charge money for the books or the entertainment or the educational material to put on it. Um, and in West Virginia, they charge by the minute to read a book. So woe to you if you are a slow reader, you can rack up hundreds of dollars. So thank you so much for doing this. And again, to make it clear, not all tablet companies and digital in-prison readers are all the same. Most of the time when you read about them, they will be uh, gouging incarcerated people and their families. So with that uh, reminder, I want to jump into this, um, more into this discussion about how you navigate content censorship. I mean, you know, from the librarian's perspective, from the perspective of somebody who uh, provides digital eBooks, what do you do when a jurisdiction or a prison or an individual uh, staff member says, no, you can't send in the color purple. No, you can't send in um, this book about healing from uh, trauma and abuse because we don't want you to send that. We know that many people use books to heal from trauma or address past issues that prisons often don't help them to address. So how do you navigate that kind of censorship in your jobs? And then also, I'd love to hear from Chris and James too about ways in which the book industry can support this as well. Not the censorship, the navigating the censorship. So I can jump in right quick. Uh, I actually, uh, I actually have a question. Maybe uh, it's a, a question for Renee, but the, uh, censorship was a big deal when I was in prison. I, I did most of my, I did all of my time in the state of Maryland and just certain things uh, that they just didn't want you to learn. Like they didn't want you to kind of like uh, no civil rights. So no, like kind of like prison system. So like Michelle, like, Michelle Alexander's uh, book, um, The New Death Pro, was a very popular book, which I've read five times and was a mandatory read for my book club. But I believe that her book is banned in many states all over the country. And I don't think it's a dangerous book, but they don't want you to know like that information um, that's in there. They don't want you like to wake up. And so my question um, is, you know, there was a fine line that I understood while in prison of what books I thought I can get 
And then I would also put covers on my books because I didn't want like the prison officials knowing what I was reading. So I would take a paper bag and tape it over my book and write like a lo- another label on it. But my question is, I guess for Renee, what is the current process of getting books in without rocking the boat? And then the second part question is, what should it be? So I think some of that depends on obviously what system you're dealing with. And it might be useful to do some research on how progressive or not the agency you're working with is. Um, Because here in speaking in Colorado, we, um, the department isn't doing some of those arbitrary things. We have their specific criteria that they're looking at. um, And so we don't experience as much of those kind of broad stroke. We do do, broad stroke bands in the way some of the other systems do. But um, we do have things like bands in place for hardcover, speaking of content, content neutral bands, hardcovers for certain populations can't, ha- can't have hardcover materials, but then that limits their access to especially nonfiction items. Um, so I think it would be useful to, to look at kind of where the system is at in terms of Um, what their philosophy is um, when you're trying to determine is this something that's going to push the line and potentially cause issues. Um, And then what it should be, I think, um, again, in Colorado, we're really fortunate that we, my unit has, we write the library policy for the Department of Corrections, and we work really closely with them um, in regards to their um, policy development for their overall sense. Um, it's called publications um, right. policy. And we have made sure that we at least have a library advocate in, in sitting on that committee. Um, and we work really hard to get staff trained to feel confident that they can stand up to, you know, an Intel supervisor and sometimes their supervisor and as associate warden and um, those, those kinds of things. And Colorado also does require, um, notification to publishers. So that is, um, a piece where publishers can can come in and, and help kind of advocate for titles as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I, I have a couple responses. One, um, I think to Chris's point about covering the books, the technology itself because you have a 10 inch device, which is equivalent to a hardcover book, by the way, with a secure case um, inside correctional institutions, you can sort of hide what you're reading, right? No one knows what you're doing on your device. Um, And it actually provides cover in not just access to books, but in people actually doing programming because there's also sometimes a stigma associated with people who want to try to do programming. Chris can talk um, about that. I think the other thing that we found is that as we grow uh, in our jurisdictions, who, by the way, run from conservative, very conservative states to very liberal states, uh, we can control what's on those devices. So we actually, uh, if a state pushes back and we've had states push back and say, oh, we, we don't allow this book in X state. What we've said to them is, all of our other jurisdictions allow it and our library is available to everyone. So we don't pull it off the shelf. Uh, We also try um, to, I just searched our collection, James. We do have Obama's biography uh, in there. So just wanted to make sure you knew that. We also bring other resources into the devices. So beyond just the library, we work with the Marshall Project and have their content available uh, on the device. So I think what we're really trying to do is say, you know, we understand their issues with limiting access, but we don't want to participate in that as much as possible. Thank you. Um, And Renee and Artie, given that we're in this kind of never ending pandemic, and perhaps this is more a question for Renee, but maybe Chris is also dealt with this, what's been the access, you know, that people have been able to have for libraries or for books during the pandemic? I mean, we've heard about so many prisons, you know, going on quarantine, going into isolation. 
outside staff not being allowed to come in because of fears of bringing in COVID, um, programs being shut down, movement being shut down, but also mail slowing down to like a trickle, you know? So what has been, what was access like before the pandemic? Because we know not everybody gets to just get up and walk to the library like you would uh, here on the outside, even if that might be fraught with obstacles. Um, and then what does it look like now that uh, there are all these lockdowns and quarantines happening? So um, I, I, the libraries before pre-pandemic were a combination of uh, groups coming in to, to visit the library and then some of the some higher custody level groups receiving delivery services about once a week. Um, and during the pandemic, it was actually the groups who came in to visit who probably had the worst access because they closed the libraries or if they were able to open, they were it was in significantly reduced numbers. Um, and in some cases, they reduced the number of items they could check out because of concerns about having to quarantine materials before they could be circulated again, um, and the collections not being able to stand, sustain pre-circulation, um, the, the limit prior to the, the pandemic. In our, at least, so that I, I think is pretty, pretty widespread, the access was, was pretty limited. Um, and then fortunately for our higher security um, facilities, it was pretty much business as normal for them. And they continued to just deliver materials to their um, residents and um, provided many of the same services that they had provided throughout. But they were that those couple of facilities were, were an anomaly, anomaly for sure. Um, and so, we're really looking at how can we um, bring in digital uh, items to help um, maybe rectify some of the issues that, ha that happened around access to physical materials. Yeah, I would say uh, in some ways the, the pandemic has sped up access to digital resources. I mean, certainly we saw that, we got calls from a number of jurisdictions saying, you know, can we use devices? Our, our devices, because they're programmatically focused, they also have access to a video classroom feature. So they could use that to bring some of the resources that were previously not allowed um, in, in with the COVID issues uh, in. Uh, we had one of our institutions that was in 23 hour lockdown for over a year because of the pandemic. So there they were completely dependent on the technology. Um, so I think the pandemic has actually in, in, in a perverse way um, made institutions rethink the uh, need for an access to technology. If I could just add to that, uh, um, Artie uh, and Renee, uh, one of the things I did uh, was I stayed in constant contact with my publisher. I'm published through uh, Putnam under Penguin Random House. And uh, I was talking to them about the National Corrections Library and, and book uses, particularly like my book. How, you know, you didn't want to know like, what were people reading? Uh, what is, you know, what are like the, the reading, like habits, the process? And what I realized was that like there was uh, the publishing companies, uh, should be educated to like how thing, how the reading, uh, how it operates behind uh, behind the fence because they didn't know. And I, I will say after um, uh, just bringing them up the speed of how things have operated, there's been several meetings and Putnam has been incredibly uh, helpful in helping people get access, not just to my book, but to other books. And so I think there's an opportunity for publishers is to make sure we know about the processes of uh, how people can get access to books. Because I don't think most publishers know. Yeah, uh, actually that's a good point. Sorry, I'm gonna step in Renee. I think um, one of the things publishers can really do is we actually, APDF pays for all of this access to books, right? We license them just like anybody else would and we pay for access. If publishers want to help, they can help by donating access, right? 
because we have a limited budget. We're a company. Uh, so if, if folks want to actually um, give access, one of the things Chris did was get his publisher to donate um, X number of digital copies to books, uh, his books. That leads into my next question, which is, unless James, did you have anything to add to this? You've been very quiet. I have so many things to add. Uh, <laughs> it's, um, I think um, that the pandemic has accelerated the introduction of digital materials into prisons is true. I think we're at a really important inflection point for uh, access to literature in prisons right now when it comes to the introductions of e-readers. And we have seen prison officials basically introduce e-readers at the exact same time that they dramatically restrict access to physical books. And then they use this as a, look, we're not, you know, we're not censoring books, we're bringing books into the 21st century without capturing the fact that, um, Victoria, as you were saying, where, you know, some of these e-reader vendors, you know, make their, make these books material only for cost or only for marked up costs and, and there may be technological issues. We need to think of e-readers as supplementing, not supplanting access to physical books. And we have to be, um, unified and vocal on that because we are seeing as we speak um, prison officials try to position this as e-readers versus access to physical books. That, that's a very good point. I think we should also mention here uh, law libraries because there, uh, just like there was limited access to libraries, there was very limited access to law libraries. And so what we really need to do is, uh, and we have free law library on our devices as well, uh, and, and that is something that I think 100%, we look at our devices as a supplement and expansion of, of prison programming and resources. We do not look at it as a replacement for. And just so everyone's clear, you can't just give somebody a digital device and go, it's going to change your outcome. You still need really good teachers and really good access to real programs. Thank you. And so given that this is a webinar directed at people in the book industry, like what can people in the book industry do to support getting books to incarcerated readers? Artie, you talked about, you know, them donating or uh, access to uh, licenses for eBooks. I'm assuming, Renee, you talked about the fact that the Colorado Library spends a huge amount of money on books. I co-founded a program that relies solely on donated books, you know, to send to people in prison. If people did not donate books, we would have nothing to send to people. Um, but, you know, what are other ways that the book industry can support readers behind bars, whether it's, you know, through library or prison programs, helping to challenge censorship, what are other things that people can do? Like if you were to give people three marching orders uh, when they walk away from this webinar to take to their next meeting or to their boss, what would it be? I could, um, well, James, I'll go after you. All right, <laughs> all right, so I'll, I'll start. So so I've been working on this for uh, for the past two years and someone had mentioned um, books2prison.net, which I, I work with them. I've been working with them for a while um, and other uh, organizations that get books into prisons. And oftentimes when I do book talks or just uh, public speaking or just fundraising activities, it, it, I found that it's helpful to either have a mechanism, a fiscal sponsor, or a lot of these nonprofits can take donations to pay for books, but there needs to be a process, a logistical process of where the books go, where they're shipped and how you get them into prisons. Uh, they, they usually have to be paperbacks. But another thing that I will say too is uh, through through my foundation, uh, we also um, have talked about this recently with the National Corrections Library, like there is a cost to get a book into the system. So just uh, as we, we make out uh, um, pleas for people to donate to the foundation or buy books to get them shipped in, uh, we also have a mechanism for people to make donations for uh, electronic books to be put onto tablets also. So I think that's something that we should also maybe consider as long as they're not being, in my opinion, as long as they're not being charged to read the book, you know, um, we, we should consider doing that. 
I would add to that as a matter of policy, we in this country should put in place laws that actually prohibit uh, incarcerated folks and their friends and family from being charged to read or access to books. That is shockingly, nothing like that exists in this country. There is no law in that regard. And just as states and counties are saying we shouldn't charge for prison phone calls, we shouldn't be charging for access to books. That's just a fundamental right. Uh, I'll jump in if I may. Um, you know, a, a first step that could be taken today going back from this meeting is, you know, figure out for your own publishing organization, are you receiving uh, messages from prisons telling you that your, um, that your book has been rejected? Right. Some states, it's as a matter of regulation, include, and the federal system has this too, as a matter of regulation, it's a requirement that they inform the publisher that the book has been rejected. Where are you getting those? Where are you getting them? Do you have them all in one place or are they being you know, put in, uh, in the recycling bin? Um, communicate that, share that information with books through prisons programs, your local books through prisons program, right? If you don't know where the nearest book to prison program is in your area, uh, you look it up you know, today, look it up right after this meeting. Tell it to people, tell it to organizations like us at Pan America. Um, consider telling it to your authors. Presumably your authors would want to know that their book is being blocked. I believe, and I, I actually would like to get uh, other panelists feedback on this. I believe that you should also start a process by which you will, you will complain to every um, notice that you receive. I would say make it, make it a, a, a requirement as a, for, as a formulaic requirement every time you receive one. That way you don't have prisons being like, well, why did they complain about this book and not about this book, right? Just make it every time you receive a complaint that you have a process by which you will stand up for the merit of your book. Um, and including if they say like, listen, we went through the complaint process, we've made our final decision, there's nothing you, you can do, to be on the record saying, we just want you to know we don't agree with your assessment that our book is dangerous. Um, and obviously you don't have, you know, you don't have to be intense about it, but you can say something along the lines of, you know, Warden, you know, we respect that your job is to keep the institution safe. Our job is to fight for the rights of our authors at every step, and we plan to do so. Put them on notice that you will assert the rights of, of yourself and your authors to be read. And that, I believe, will have a tangible effect. Uh, on you know the decisions that individual institutions or officers make in deciding whether or not to ban a book. Now, I, I'm always very conscious of. Chris used the phrase "rock the boat," right? Um, you know, it's always good to think about the fact that prison officials might respond defensively. And I have had this thought of, you know, is there a, a danger that if you challenge this, that they'll say, "Oh, uh, you know, screw you. We'll put we'll put this uh, book on the statewide list." I. I've thought about that. I think that overall the right move is to complain about these bans vociferously and at every opportunity so that you put the prison officials on notice that you will push back. Um, but that, you know, I think if you're gonna do that, it also behooves you to be connected with your local books through bars organizations, be connected with um, organizations representing the voice of incarcerated people and use them as sounding boards for the steps you take so that you're making sure that these things are helpful. Uh, and not counterproductive. But overall, if the publishing industry pushed back on these bans, I genuinely believe we would see a sea change in the trends of censorship and book banning in, in this country. And one way to actually push back is there is an organization called the Correctional Leaders Association. It is all the heads of corrections uh, in uh, the country. And I think the book industry group could actually do a presentation uh, along these lines. And I think most commissioners of corrections actually don't even think about this stuff. They don't know about it. It's done at a much lower level. So I think you have an opportunity to raise awareness and actually to change some of the, uh, the messaging to them. And I was just, James took my point. I was going to say, um, because in Colorado, we have the Publishers can submit appeals when you receive those notifications in Colorado, and those appeals go to the headquarters committee, So, which often has a very different lens than a facility, an individual facility committee. They're looking at things like, what is the all the litigation around 
these issues mean? And should we really be banning these things? So it can make a difference for, um, because what happens to individuals, a warden can say whether or not an individual can appeal or not in Colorado. Um, they can say, you don't, you don't have any appeal rights. Um, we can appeal in the libraries, but the publisher can also appeal those decisions um, because obviously the library doesn't have every book. So it would be really helpful for publishers to participate in that process as well. And it's, uh, you know, in prison, the individual incarcerated people have to go through the entire internal process before they can lodge a judicial yeah. complaint, right, under the Prison Litigation Reform Act. Um, furthermore, it's individual incarcerated people who have to worry about retaliation right? You know, you complain, you get a reputation for being a complainer, and that can cause consequences for you. Publishers do not have to worry about that, right? Um, both judicially and in terms of actual retaliation. So it's publishers are even better placed to fight this fight than individual incarcerated people who are the subject of these bans. I uh, agree. If I, if I can add into this, uh, my book was banned in the prison that I grew up in. And I was confused because <laughs> it was such a positive book. But uh, Renee, to your point, I think uh, when we complained about it, it went up to someone at headquarters who actually read the book. Because like the first thing, my book got banned because someone at the prison was like, oh, he was in print. We know who he is. We, we got to ban it. And I was like, he didn't even read it. And so someone at headquarters read the book and was like, this is actually a good book. This is actually like motivating people like we don't get it. And so they reversed it. And then they ended up buying a few hundred copies of the book. And then I actually had an opportunity to go into the prison, but um, there was a process for it to be appealed. And so I agree, uh, you know, publishers and, and, and authors should, should really uh, advocate on, on, on the outside of making sure that people have access to the books. Thank you all. And thank you, Artie, for giving, you know, for, for voicing a way that publishers can try to work with commissioners on this. If your book has been banned by a prison and the commissioners and the headquarters are a little recalcitrant. I also want to throw out that Prison Legal News, which is an organization based in Florida and does a lot of work around prison lawsuits and litigation, always challenges their uh, the denial of books and they will go to court and they will fight it. So if you send a nice letter and they still say, we don't care, we're still banning your book, I suggest dropping a line to prison legal news and say, how would I go about challenging this and taking it further up the ladder when there is somebody who is not as interested in uh, you know, reading the book and finding out why it's, it's banned, but just wants to make a blanket book ban. Because again, I think that as everybody on this panel has said, you know, they start, you know, they keep eroding and eroding and eroding people's ability to get books. So what might not seem like a big deal for this book then starts to bleed into access to all sorts of other books and uh, educational materials. If um, I can add, Prison mm -hmm. Legal News will also reach out to groups like I've written half a dozen um, supporting letters for Prison Legal News over the uh, over the years, and so that's something that publishers can do: not only complain themselves, you know, complain themselves, but reach out to like-minded organizations and say, "Will you send a letter of support, you know, for the right of an incarcerated person to read our book?" So um, the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, real quick, uh, read that too long ago, published an article uh, uh, partnership with APDS uh, through USA Today that I just put in the chat uh, about uh, what's been happening in regards to read. And I think uh, this was West Virginia too that we uh, focus on, uh, but also don't underestimate the power of social media too. So I took a lot of this stuff to, uh, to Twitter, to Facebook, and like politicians, a lot of people was like, this is so stupid. Like they, you know, and it, it put a lot of pressure and a lot of light on, on some of these jurisdictions. So it was like, well, this is kind of stupid. And they ended up reversing themselves. So I guess my point is don't underestimate the power of social media of, of getting the word out about what's happening. Um, we have a question specifically for Renee. So Renee, you get to be on the hot seat, which is, where does the Colorado system purchase its books for their libraries? Do you get them directly from publishers? Do you go through distributors or third parties? Um, so we, we, we use distributors primarily just as a, um, it's easier for us to distribute to 21 different Department of Corrections facilities that way. 
Um, but we are looking at, we're forming, forming some more local partnerships with um, um, Tattered Cover in Colorado, looking at, at doing more purchasing from them and working with them um, so that we're doing things more locally. And, um, but we are always interested if there is something that somebody wants to get into the the prisons, um, we, 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 we work directly with some authors to get some things in. And um, so we, we really can do either. We have flexibility for, for that. And my follow-up question, because I know that uh, publishers often have hurt copies of books that just have like a ding on the cover, or you know, maybe there's a typo someplace that is not extremely terrible, but they can't sell copies. Would the library, I know Books Through Bars has gotten many, you know, uh, copies of hurt books. Would they be able to donate them to the library? Is it okay if it's slightly damaged? I think in a, in a lot of a lot of locations in the country, that would be would be great. There are a lot are many systems that don't have any kind of budget in the way that Colorado mm -hmm. does. So that is a um, very valuable kind of resource. Would be a very valuable kind of resource for them to get more materials into their um, into their libraries. I think to answer that right quick, I, I've done that a few times, and I have that relationship with Putnam and. I mean, I, I cringe a little bit, but we just had to like tear the covers. The hard covers had to tear them off. And then, so there's no cover and it's like, ah, but we were able to get the actual book in. But we, we had to do that a few times, but not saying we should do it, but this was something that I did in the past. Oh, I have torn many a uh, hard cover, cover off to get it into a prison that would not otherwise allow the book in. Um, so after a while, I stopped feeling bad about it. I was like, you know, it will go to somebody who need, you know, who needs to read yeah. the book or who wants to read the book or who might not get it otherwise. So, so I just want to reiterate to folks, like access to the library is very regulated, just like mm -hmm. it is to the mm -hmm. law library. You have to keep in mind, especially during COVID, they will use any excuse not to move incarcerated folks or let them go places. So donating books is fabulous you have to put pressure on the systems themselves to make that access ubiquitous, no matter whether they can leave their cell or not, which by the way, no one, everyone should be allowed to leave their cell. Uh, but, but that is, you know, I, I think I was in an upstate maximum security prison about a month ago and I heard over and over again, the lack of access. They were not allowed out of their cells because of COVID. And so we really have to uh, approach this in many different ways, not just donating books. Yes, yes. Um, and I also want to add that even before the pandemic, there were places, there were many prisons where people are put in solitary confinement. They're put in something the size of your very smallest bathroom um, for 23 and a half to 24 hours a day. And not every prison has a library to begin with, not every Correct. state prison system. And even in say New York state prisons, which has a library and says, thou shalt give access to people in solitary confinement to the library. I've heard so many reports of people saying, that's a myth. I've been in solitary confinement for seven years. Imagine living in your bathroom for seven years and never once have books ever come this way. And so I also want to add that um, unlike uh, Artie and Renee, uh, Books Through Bars and Books to Prisoners program send the books directly to people in prison. So they write a letter, it says, dear Books to Prisoners, my name is so-and-so, I would like a book on X, Y, or Z. And then uh, volunteers pack a, a book that is on that subject, if not that book, depending on what the stock is and send it so it goes directly to that person. And again and again, people in solitary confinement have said, even years before the pandemic, that that was their only source of books. And if there's no prison official on this line, sometimes they share these books and you know pass them from cell to cell. So a book that is sent to one person ends up getting read by five to 20 people on that housing unit who otherwise would not have books up to read at all. I think also uh, sometimes prisons uh, limit the number of books you could have in your cell. So yes. just keep that in mind as well. Uh, 
Oh, Brian, you came on, so I'm, I'm just wondering if, if we're out of time or if there's something else. <laughs> well, we have, I have time for one more question that I might pose, but I also wanted to make sure that uh, folks on the uh, webinar um, saw that uh, Chris had posted a link to a piece that he'd written for USA Today, I think in February, uh, earlier in the conversation. So if you scroll back to about 1.38, uh, you can pick that up. That's a, a good link to see. So finally, like, are there any, I know we've covered a lot, we've given people numerous marching orders, but you know, like if, if you were to, you know, like some, you know, want them to go away with one last marching order, one last thing to think about, one last something, you know, like what can the book industry do? What can people who might not be thinking about prisons, you know, usually or access to books in prisons do, um, whether it is in their professional capacity or maybe even in their personal capacity? I mean, I'll go first because I just posed this question out of the blue to you, but um, I'd say pay attention to legislation that might impact people's ability to get books in prison. Um, New York State a few years ago, pre-pandemic, whenever that was, um, proposed legislation that they were going, proposed a policy in which certain prisons were not going to be allowed to get books except through a special authorized book, book vendor. They were going to start it at like, I think three or four prisons. And then if it, four prisons, and then if it went well, it would roll out, you know, to the rest of the state prison systems, thus prohib prohibiting anyone else from sending books to people in prison. And it was a very small number, relatively speaking, to the number of books available in the world of books. And the subject matter was really limited. And of course, there was not going to be anything political, anything about trauma or addiction, or, you know, it was all, there were numerous biblical and Christian books. Um, there was not a lot of other types of books. So pay attention to that. Even you can do this, you can get your loved ones and family members involved because then you can drop a line to your elected official and say, this sucks, don't support this. Please actively oppose this when it comes up for discussion. Well, I'll be, uh, I'll be selfish then and say, would love to have digital copies of books donated to us. Um, as well as audiobooks. There's a lot of folks who are incarcerated who read um, below an eighth grade level. Don't underestimate the numbers. Um, and so any, um, anything that would serve them in a audiobook format is also very helpful. Uh, and, and I will echo what Artie was saying about digital materials because in Colorado, we are really looking to um, find ways to get them through the libraries into the hands of readers. Um, and the Department of Corrections is on board with us. So um, finding ways to get digital resources in the hands of the, those who are incarcerated. And don't forget, I will just throw out there, don't forget that there are a lot of youth too who have yeah. significantly limited access to reading and, and in some cases, much, even much more restricted um, than adults, so. And I would like to add to it uh, by saying, I, books saved my life, as I talked about earlier. Uh, and as, as a taxpaying citizen now, we, we pay, we all pay for people's um, incarceration and we should get, we should want a, 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 a positive return on our taxpaying dollars. And I've watched people who didn't have access to reading and was just like this bore and just, you know, getting into trouble like this, like access to this information is important. I watched it change people. I watched people turn their lives around, come home, get jobs, go back to school, start families. This is what we want. And so I just want to remind us all why this is so important. Uh, be public, be visible don't consent to these book bans, don't consent to the framing where we have to think of things, uh, where we think of books as potential dangerous instruments rather than as, uh, as instruments of rehabilitation and, and just um, stand up for the, the morality of treating our incarcerated population like a, a reader base, like any other segment of the population. Uh, public attention absolutely uh, is really plays a big role. Um, 
when public outrage occurs in regards to these types of book in in regards to book bans, often they're overturned. Uh, I, Prison book banning thrives in obscurity. It exists in large, I mean, it, it is as systemic as it is in large part because it is largely invisible to the average non-incarcerated American. When you see information about it, be vocal, use social media, et cetera, and say, we're not okay with this. So Chris, James, Victoria, um, Renee, and Artie, thank you very much for doing this today. I know that you each have busy schedules, but this is a topic clearly that you all care a lot about individually and collectively. I, I hope that you've helped us start a conversation that will continue into next year and beyond um, that BISG can make a difference. To that end, um, both Julie Blackberg, who helped put this program together today for us, and I have been taking notes throughout, and we're going to compile a list of resources based upon your suggestions uh, that we'll post on the BISG website. You've already seen some comments in the chat about people who are finding this a particularly useful and motivational opportunity to go back to the people they work with and figure out what to do next. And I hope that's the start of something that we can build on the work that Penn has been doing for quite some time, but maybe make it broader across the industry. Thank, Thank you. you. And take care.